Welcome all who have joined us this afternoon. Um, this is the fourth webinar um, hosted for NASA's Break the Ice Lunar Challenge. Um, today we'll be focused mostly on presentations by our esteemed panelists, um, but I'll just kick things off very quickly with some housekeeping items and uh, a note of congratulations to our phase two level one winners. So today we will be hearing remarks by astronaut Don Thomas, as well as remarks from Carl Vanden Ordel of Anglo-American. Uh, and then we'll finish with Q&A and some closing remarks. Um, like past webinars, um, panelists will be able to speak. Um, we will, I will be share, sharing screen, um, but attendees will be unable to speak, but are welcome to participate through the Q&A feature. As I, as I mentioned, we'll be conducting Q&A at the end of the call. So you can submit your questions through that taskbar. Um, however, questions related to level two and level three should be sent to the challenge admin email and will not be addressed in this webinar. So the, the scope of the question should be more um, at the actual content uh, of the presentations today. Um, with that, um, we will be recording um, this and uploading to the BreakTheIceChallenge.com website. So you'll be able to find this recording um, on the resources and media page. Um, to, before we begin, we want to give a huge congratulations to the Phase 2 Level 1 winners. We received many innovative concepts, submissions, uh, technical designs, and we are now progressing to the next stage of the challenge. Um, but we also want to say thank you to everyone who participated. Um, there was many innovative submissions, uh, and we are thrilled with the um, outcomes and the solutions and the ideas that the entire community has contributed. Um, so again, thanks to all and, and congratulations to the phase two level one winners. With that, I can pass it over to Don Thomas. Don, take it away. Thank you. And I, I think I need you to enable my video. Okay. Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon. And I appreciate everybody being with us today to be part of this webinar. And I wanna congratulate uh, myself, uh, all, of, all of you on your phase two level one success of this challenge. There's a lot of work to be done yet. I think we've made great progress. You have made great progress. And I'm looking forward to uh, watching as this challenge develops on. Uh, my name is Don Thomas. I'm a former NASA astronaut. And I had the amazing opportunity to fly on four space shuttle missions, three of those on Space Shuttle Columbia and one flight on Space Shuttle Discovery. I've spent a total of 44 days in space. And during that time, I went around the Earth 692 times. Frequently, when I'm talking with students, they'll ask me the question, have I ever been to the moon? Have I been to any other planets? And I sadly have to tell them, no, I've only been in Earth orbit. And they'll say, where did you go then? I said, I just went in circles around the earth 692 times. And I could just see the disappointment on their face uh, when I tell them that. But next slide, we are going, we are leaving earth orbit and heading uh, deeper into space once again, using our new space launch system rocket. We just had the Artemis one mission launching in mid November, as I'm sure you're all aware of and uh, orbited the moon, came back last month in December. All indications are the mission was a great success and that's gonna open the door for us to do Artemis II missions, you know, sending uh, astronauts in orbit around the moon and then the Artemis III mission landing two astronauts on the south pole of the moon. So there's a lot of excitement coming up for us all. Next. So we're heading back to the moon. We've been there before, back in the, when I was in high school, we landed on the moon six times, 12 humans have walked on the moon, 24 people, humans have orbited the moon and we're heading back. And it's a familiar area for, for us. We see it frequently in the night sky. And, uh, but you have to remember this is far away. It's a quarter of a million miles away and it's about a two to three day trip to get there. For me going on the space shuttle to get to earth orbit, it was eight and a half minutes. But here we're talking about three days getting to the moon. And when we go, next slide, we're gonna start building bases on the moon. 
Maybe the early designs will be a, a buried habitat, burying it in the lunar regolith to protect us from the radiation and to protect us from the thermal you know, extremes on the surface of the moon. But eventually, next slide, we'll be building larger and larger colonies, maybe something like this in the future. And these missions are gonna present huge challenges, even bigger than the ones we've already faced as, at NASA during our 60 some year history already. Next slide. During the Apollo program, I think you're all familiar with Apollo 13. And as the crew was heading to the moon, about halfway between the Earth and the moon, there was an explosion in one of the oxygen tanks, a catastrophic event. And uh, the astronauts were losing their oxygen, the fuel cells used to generate the electricity were shutting down. And this presented a huge, huge challenge for NASA. And it took uh, an incredible team of people in mission control uh, representing the NASA folks, contractors, university people from across the United States and around the world to bring these astronauts back home safely. Next. One of the big challenges on this mission was that the carbon dioxide levels inside the lunar module were building up higher and higher. They only had limited amount of carbon dioxide scrubbing material available in the lunar module. We use lithium hydroxide in space. And the command module used uh, square canisters and the lunar module used round canisters. And very uh, shortly you know, into this mission, when they're trying to bring the astronauts home, they were running out of the round canisters for the lunar module. And so uh, again, this is another opportunity for an incredible creative team on the ground to come up with solutions. How can we get a square lithium hydroxide canister to work in the round hole of the lunar module? And uh, they were able to accomplish this and it helped bring our crew back safely to earth as well. So this is, again, creative thinking by the teams on the ground to help protect the astronauts and save the mission. Okay, next. During our Skylab space station, we also had challenges. As we launched the Skylab uh, space station module uh, during launch, one of the solar panels got ripped off during launch. It also, in that process, it ripped off one of the micrometeorite shields and some of the thermal insulation around our space station. So as soon as the Skylab had got to orbit, temperatures inside the Skylab started to soar well over 100 degrees, which made it uninhabitable for the astronauts. So again, we had a creative group of people on the ground, you know, forming like a tiger team coming up with, how can we solve this problem? How can we come up with a fix? And they came up with a pretty quick, uh, unique solution, I thought. It was a parasol. So it's like a giant beach umbrella. And they could poke this through an airlock in the side of the uh, module. And then they could open it up like an umbrella and bring it down. And the shade that this provided immediately brought the temperatures down within the uh, Skylab space station, made it habitable for the astronauts to perform their missions. Next. And once they got the parasol up there, then our engineering teams you know, had more time to develop a, a longer term more robust solution, which you see here, just another you know, sunshade that went on top of the original parasol. But again, creative thinking on the ground you know, helped save this mission. Next. So NASA does an outstanding job of being prepared for failures in general. You know, it only takes eight and a half minutes for the space shuttle to get to orbit, but I trained for hundreds of hours in the simulator, practicing what to do if one of the engines should shut down, or if we lose communication or we lose power for events like that, we're fully prepared. But even with all this training and preparation, these unexpected challenges like what happened in Apollo 13 and Skylab, they're gonna occur. And this creative and diverse thinking is often gonna be required to overcome these challenges. Okay, next. So with our new uh, Artemis and Space Launch System rockets, we're going to the moon. That's what we're here to discuss today, but we're not stopping there. We're, we have plans to go on to visit asteroids and go on to the planet Mars and go even deeper than that in space. Okay, next. So let me talk a minute about Mars. This is a destination that, that's in our future as well. Next slide. You know, Mars is a unique uh, planet. Three and a half billion years ago, 
oceans covered 36% of the surface of Mars. It was very much a twin planet to, to planet Earth. Next. But from our rovers today, traveling around Mars, we know Mars today is just a barren, dry, desolate uh, desert area, as shown in this picture. No sign of any surface water at all. Next. But in 2008, we landed a spacecraft on Mars called the Phoenix. And it only operated three months before the Martian winter came and we lost communication and power to, to our lander. But the most significant discovery from the Phoenix was it discovered water ice on Mars. Next. It had an arm with a scoop on the end and it was able to dig small trenches on Mars. And it dug a trench that you see here on the left and there were some small whitish particles that you see there with the arrows pointing to them. Four days later, they looked at that same area and those white particles were gone, which led the scientists to conclude that that is water ice that is sublimated and evaporated away. So for the first time, we knew for sure we've got water ice on Mars. Next. And since then, we have other uh, you know, confirmation of water underneath the surface of Mars. In the Newton crater, this is an image from one of our orbiting spacecraft. You see these dark streaks coming down. And these are potential water flows from ice melt during the Martian summer. You know, it's only during the summer that the temperatures get above freezing on Mars. It's quite a cold environment. But during the summer months, you can see some of these streaks that are probably most likely from water ice melting into water. Next. An additional crater, this is the Hale Crater. Uh, you see these dark streaks as well, you know, coming down. So again, there's more and more evidence that under the surface of Mars that we see, there's a lot of potential water ice there just waiting for us. Next. We've also discovered uh, buried ice fields on Mars. Next. And the Europeans with one of their spacecraft took these images of the Korolev crater on Mars. This is a massive crater 51 miles or so across and it contains over a mile thick layer of water ice. So these are such incredible resources that we know are on you know, the surface of Mars there that'll make it easier for our missions in the future. Okay, next. So just a reminder, we're going to the moon now but we're also planning on going to Mars. This could be 10 years, 15 years, 20 years in the future. We don't have a, a specific deadline for this. It depends on budgets and other factors, but we'll be sending astronauts to the planet Mars. So I wanna end with this last slide, next. This is just the message that we need you. You know, we're designing th these new rockets and capsules and spacecraft and habitats you know, and, and rovers for the planet Mars and, and the moon as well, but we're never gonna get there. We're never gonna accomplish these missions without teams like yourself helping us out get there. So on behalf of all the astronauts, this is past, present and future. I just wanna thank you personally for helping us out with this challenge that will allow us to successfully accomplish these most challenging missions in the future. Excellent, Don. Thanks so much for those words. Um, I can go ahead and pass it over to Carl. Um, Carl, you should be able to, um, you are now a co-host, so you should be able to also um, turn on your video camera if you would like to. There you go. Awesome. Cool. Thank you very much for that, Don. Um, yeah, I hope I can uh, do justice to you opening up for this webinar, but um, yeah, just to bring it back down to earth, uh, I, I prepared a few slides to sort of discuss uh, and understand mining practices that we currently have on mine, uh, on ground, on on uh, on earth, and sort of uh, show you some examples of of how we're doing that, what to look for uh, for different outcrops, and then just sort of tie that into the break the ice lunar challenge, and uh, what you as teams have. Have really already probably looked through and tried to understand and hopefully from what I present to you today you'll get a good understanding of where you should be looking at next um, for your 
beautiful robots and machines that you're busy preparing for. Uh, next, please. All right, myself, um, mechanical engineer, um, fantastically chose to go down that line, um, but landed up uh, in the mining industry, uh, going through Anglo-American Platinum, through the graduate scheme, and miraculously found myself um, at a mine that started in 2015 with productionizing proof of concept underground trackless mining machines. So instead of going and reaching for the stars, as Don did, um, yeah, went underground, uh, deep tunnels, dark tunnels, very small tunnels. Uh, but the really exciting thing was taking machines that hadn't uh, proven themselves or hadn't been proven in a mining environment and putting them through not only machine capabilities, but actually getting people trained up to operate them that had not been part of the design teams for those machines, which was really interesting and cool. Um, the next slide. And from there, uh, we made some great progresses with those new machines. And now I find myself working on uh, decarbonizing massive mining haul trucks. So these 300 ton ultra class haul trucks, um, Anglo American, we launched it last year in May 2022. And uh, yeah, that's been a massive highlight uh, for me in my career, but just also showing the different scales. Um, from nice small uh, machinery that's uh, 600 millimeters high um, to this massive uh, dump truck uh, that we have on the slides over here. Uh, next slide, please, Oliver. So why do we need mining? Um, ultimately, um, without mining uh, on the earth today, um, we, our society probably would not have developed at the rate and the pace that it's done to date, uh, just some graphics at the bottom uh, left of the screen there, uh, just sort of indicating that, you know, it's predicted that population rise will still increase. Uh, but with that increase uh, in the future, uh, the need for industrial minerals will increase with that. And we'll get to the next slide just now uh, to, so sh to show sort of why and, and where do these minerals go into. But have you ever looked at the ingredients on a packet of chips um, or crisps, uh, as you might call them, um, and got in a little bit of a fright to what's in them? Uh, a cell phone is no different. Any technology, uh, probably the monitor that you're looking on or a nice Apple product that you're sitting in front of has got the same sort of uh, ingredient lists to it. And, and as an example, um, roughly on this little cell phone image that we have here, 15 minerals are used in the manufacture, um, or not in the manufacture, but actually used in the product to get to that workable product at the end. And of those 15 minerals, uh, you can find them in about 12 ore bodies. Um, and those ore bodies, unfortunately, are not down the road, uh, not on a little farm nearby you. They're all over the world. Um, and at the moment, some of them are extremely difficult to find and difficult to mine. And uh, hence why uh, some of the, the NASA team is really looking to get mining out, uh, not only on Earth, but um, on other planets and obviously moons and asteroids around us. But anyways, getting back to it, um, and you can go to the next slide, please, Oliver. You get multiple um, minerals that come from different ore bodies, but are all unique in their way on how they formed and where they came from within the Earth's crust and, well, leading from the magma. And as an example, uh, this table that's on the screen there, uh, you've got the group of elements um, on the left-hand side and examples of those elements on the right-hand side. And metallic, semi-metallic elements, uh, you get basically two ore bodies that you'd normally find those in. Um, that have come from a, a high heat environment. So um, from magma uh, down in the um, earth or below the crust coming out through to earth's surface, uh, you'll find definite uh, gold, silver, and copper uh, type ore bodies that came from a melted product. Non-metallic elements, potassium, sodium, phosphorus, they tempt te gen generally, sorry, um, come mixed within other elements, um, but you also do find bodies where it's a homogeneous type formation. Uh, think of salt mines um, and that sort of uh, those sort of things. Gems, diamond spheres, they also come from 
high heat, high pressure environments. But what we'll get to on the next slide is it's a mixture of elements um, and basically how those elements formed uh, within that crust uh, where they came from. And this next slide sort of shows uh, a cross cut of the Earth's crust and sort of how some of those forms and flows um, represent themselves. Uh, these predominantly from um, uh, the magma, obviously pushing through differently through faults, sorry, faults, um, transfer boundaries, plate boundaries within the Earth's crust. And those interactions of those plates obviously creating pressures and inducing cracks through which um, high pressure magmas, magma can push through. And then that forming within uh, uh, the ground and, and the mining environments in which we do go and look for those minerals and elements. The next slide. So, okay, cool. Um, sorry, I'm just noticing that it's just shifted, but that's awesome. Um, cool. Uh, three basically different types of forms that you get. Uh, the first is an igneous. So an igneous is generally a homogeneous type surface or, or sorry, um, body that has formed uh, generally from a high heat source. Uh, it's generally got large crystalline forms within it. So think of it as um, you know a sugar taffy or a toffee uh, that you guys might know uh, that's gotten a little bit hard um, or even um, yeah that's gotten hard you land up with these large crystals that over time have been allowed to cool from small to large ones um, those generally are very hard or from hard to very hard uh, depending on the type of rock that you're in um, and but easy to break up because they're hard um, so that's some type of rock the middle image there that's sedimentary deposits so that's been a flow uh, normally induced by a water flow or um, wind uh, generally taking smaller harder rocks that may have been coming from an igneous uh, type background and with softer materials that it flowed within have settled down into uh, that sedimentary deposit and that formation. Extracting rock in that form can be relatively easy. Um, you'll need to figure out and obviously um, place loads at certain points on the softer material to break out the harder material, but it's generally easier to handle. Um, underground deposits in that formation are extremely difficult to mine through for a safety of persons aspects, but uh, really really easy to mine that material out. And then the image on the uh, far left hand side, that's a metamorphic. So that's a an igneous rock that went through another formative or metamorphic change. Say uh, there was an igneous rock formation and an asteroid, uh, or at least a, a star or whatever, uh, came from uh, outer space and hit the earth, uh, forming a crater. That energy, impacting the ground or earth um, would have transferred energy into uh, the igneous rock um, generating heat and that would have caused redistribution of the grains within that igneous rock and very predominantly you get a density separation so the heavier rock uh, within a band uh, would lie towards the bottom and the lighter rocks towards the bottom um, sorry um, heavier rocks towards the bottom, lighter rocks towards the top. And that's predominantly what a lot of underground mining environments follow is a seam that has formed as a result of this metamorphic transformation. And uh, what you generally find is uh, the rock above the seam uh, is very hard um, and the rock below that seam is uh, to some extent softer but you get this structure, this doming structure that can form around that seam that you had mined. And that allows for a safer environment as opposed to the sedimentary deposits for mining. You can go to the next slide. The major thing to understand, though, is how does the ore deposit look um, on Earth? Uh, Technology is improving. Uh, they're using radar um, as an example, LIDAR, some ground penetrating radars. Uh, 
that they're using to better understand how the formation of mineralogy that they're looking for or looking at has formed. As examples on the left um, hand side, typical coal seams um, that would have uh, obviously been formed over multiple years um, from the composition of a natural matter. Um, and ultimately that forms in layers and resembles a sedimentary type deposit where if the earth around it hasn't shifted or been moved very much, um, lands up being in these long, broad coal seams that can be mined in various manners. And that sort of image gives a few examples of how one would do that. Another type of example is on the uh, right-hand image there. Um, that's more a vertically inclined um, metamorphic type seam that probably at one stage was magma coming up a fault line that may have settled and or possibly been metamorphosed, metamorphed from uh, uh, impact on the Earth's crust. But mining a vertical seam is far different to mining a horizontal or slightly sloped machine uh, seam. And ultimately, the instruments or the machinery that you'd use to mine that seam needs to be matched as best as possible to aid in, in obviously the capital uh, input that would need to go into a mine, but uh, to definitely get make a business sense for the mine at the end of the day so in that example uh, they would have started mining open pit it would have been uh, very easy to get to the reef on the top um, but as soon as that gets deeper and deeper and deeper it's easier to go down with a vertical shaft and go horizontal cross cuts as examples the next one so how do you get the rock out of the ground or the mineral out of the rock um, Blasting is always the easiest uh, and the most fun. Uh, really make a big bang and uh, send a whole bunch of uh, earth moving equipment in to go and uh, scoop, load and take the ore to a processing facility. Uh, but there's definitely others. There's mechanical means. Uh, that's the image on the left hand side. Um, and various teams around the world have been looking over the, uh, the last number of years, probably the last 25, are trying to adopt mechanical means uh, as oh, mechanical means of mining um, in underground hard rock environment. What that would land up doing, or the intention thereof, is removing explosives from an underground environment, which is a confined space, um, but really reducing the amount of energy that you would impact or put into the ground and um, uh, supporting rock that eventually would be there uh, in place for you. And then the last sort of method that's now really coming uh, into uh, play is leaching um, or chemically ex chemically extracting uh, or uh, at minerals from reef and predominantly being used in the rehabilitation or further extraction of waste dumps. Um, here in South Africa, we've got a really good um, uh, couple of stories about golden mine oh sorry gold mines um that went and sorry about that um went and started applying leaching methods to some of the uh, tailings facilities and in a way able to push out their revenues a little bit better um as well as rehabilitate that area back to um an environment that's good all righty i think Sorry about this. Give me one second. Um, you were on forty-nine. This slide. Yeah, we can go to that one. Is good. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Cool. Um, and that sort of slide talks to, you know, mining is brilliant and it's fantastic, and the and the challenges that we have with it, uh, not only from. Uh, you know, understanding machines and how machines work and, and from an engineering perspective, maintaining those machines, but also the geology around uh, mineral deposits. But our biggest challenge is we still on Earth and a lot of places have people operating uh, the machinery that we have. And I know that's slightly different for Break the Ice Challenge. We're going to probably have a, 
uh, a robot, you know, operating a machine or replacing a tool for you on your cutters, uh, as the as the case might be. But again, you know, people are used in programming that, and uh, just be cognizant of your systems and your processes that you design around it. I don't expect um, hearing news one day from Break the Ice Challenge that, um, like the image on the on the right hand side at the top. Uh, we, we've managed to find a bulldozer at the top end of a bucket excavator. But, um, you know, uh, things do happen. Weird things do happen. But as long as you've got people involved, um, things don't always get done right. Um, and like that bottom image on uh, the left-hand side, uh, even though you've got a robust mechanical hydraulic pneumatic systems on your vehicles, maybe even electrical systems, things do still go wrong and uh, you can land up losing an asset like you've lost on the bottom there. Uh, next slide. I think it's the last. The major thing I wanted to sort of bring up is uh, mining on earth um, has got its challenges, not only in the pit with people losing bulldozers uh, and or excavators setting on fire, but our legacies around mining and South Africa has just really um, got two horrible examples. But in uh, 1994, a tailings facility uh, broke its dam wall. Um, and uh, yeah, um, over 160 people lost their lives in that mudslide from that tailings facility. The image on the right hand bottom side there uh, shows what that tailings flow looked like running through the town um, and just last year um, a mining town Jagersfontein had exactly the same thing and that mine had been standing um, not operating for the last 20 years but our legacy uh, that we leave behind needs to be really thought of and administered correctly so that we don't have incidents leading to this and this has changed uh, the way regulators um, are, are looking at mining companies, but definitely how shareholders are looking at mining companies and the risk that any company that wants to start mining and mining out in outer space, we need to really be cognizant of what that legacy looks like after we've removed that mineral, used that mineral and left disaster, hopefully not in our wake. Thanks very much, Oliver. Excellent. Thank you so much for those uh, insights and those words. So we are also going to have, uh, Eric, if you want to jump on as a panelist, you should be able to um, open your mic now and I can pull up your slides if if you are uh, able to do so. Yes. Yes, I'm online. <clears throat> can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you great. Can you see the slides? I can. And you're welcome to, you could start the video if you want um, as well. One and, second, uh, make you a co host, and then you will just, be able to. Um, turn on. While you're doing that, I'll give a, uh, a brief um, shout out to the panelists. So, Don, it was, uh, it's great to hear from you again. Um, enjoyed working with you in the past. And, and Carl, I'm very happy to be following you. And some of the material that you just uh, went through will uh, connect very well with what I'm, I'm going to cover today on, on my side. So um, I am Eric Reiners um, at Caterpillar Incorporated. I'm a, a program manager in the automation and the autonomy organization. Uh, in that role, I also um, am involved in external relationship management as well uh, with both universities as well as government agencies, including NASA. Great, and Eric, you should be able to turn your camera on now. Okay. Let me know if that works. And then if we go to the next slide. So today I'm gonna to talk about, I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of Caterpillar, who we are. Um, talk about uh, autonomy uh, in terrestrial mining and construction, because I think autonomy is gonna be an important aspect relative to um, lunar applications as well. A little bit on simulation development tools that we use to develop equipment and autonomy for terrestrial applications and uh, to give you some perspective of that's likely to be important uh, for this, this lunar uh, 
efforts and so on as well, the ability to simulate that environment and look at um, differences in the environment and, and speculate on some of that since it's not well known that you can do that in simulation to, to get a better feel how robust your system might be. And then just some, and I, and I say that very clearly, only some, because there are many, but some challenges in lunar applications that um, relative from the terrestrial side that, that we would see. So if you go to the next slide. So Caterpillar, um, as many of you probably know, we are a manufacturer of uh, mining and construction equipment. Uh, we're also though in the energy and the transportation uh, areas uh, from an industry standpoint. Um, and so we, we, do, we, we do a lot of elect or, um, engine or um, electric power generation worldwide, as well as um, we have some uh, rail and marine uh, transport uh, areas within our energy and transportation segment. So we are a global company. Uh, we have over 4 million products that are running worldwide right now, um, 160 dealers uh, across 193 countries worldwide. Um, we have 150 uh, locations, CAT locations across um, 25 countries and uh, a little over 107,000 employees. Um, just to give you some perspective. Let's go to the next slide. So we at Caterpillar, as you can imagine, there's a lot of technology development that occurs in order to produce the products that we provide to the mining industry, the construction industry, et cetera. Um, but there are some areas where we are having uh, an increased or, or a very strong focus and those are in autonomy, uh, connectivity, and electrification, or what we refer to internally as the ACE um, technologies. And um, today I'm going to focus on the autonomy aspect uh, of that technology focus. So if you go to the next slide. So we've been working in this area of autonomy for quite some time, quite a long time. Um, and some of that involves uh, relationship and, and work with NASA. So in this particular slide on the left, you're seeing uh, an operator center uh, that was created in a program with Johnson Space Center looking at remote control and automation technologies back in the 2007 to 2010 timeframe. Uh, and in that program, that was the first time that we attempted long range remote control. So we controlled a Caterpillar skid steer platform in Peoria, Illinois from that operator center in, in Houston, Texas at Johnson Space Center. On the right, you can see the operator center that's actually in production today. Then you can see between these two pictures, many of the design lessons that we learned in the work with NASA and that program have uh, migrated into the actual production product that's available today. So if you go to the next slide, this is a video of our semi-autonomous tractor system. So actually, did, does a video play, um, Oliver? Because we had a little last minute uh, change this, we will not be able to play a video. Okay, well, what you would see would be a video of these dozers operating in this overburn removal um, application. And so, and the operator, is really more of now a supervisor and he's sitting in the operator station that you saw in the previous slide. And this specific example about 10 kilometers away, but he could be a thousand kilometers away. And he can take direct control of any one of these, of these dozers and he's able to do three to five of them. He can take direct control of those dozers and do some work with them to set up the task and then assign the task to the dozer and then turn it over to autonomous um, execution. And then he can monitor them as they're executing those tasks. And then again, take direct control again, if the dozer is incurring some sort of a, an exception that the autonomy system doesn't know how to handle, he'll take direct control, deal with that situation, then turn it back over to autonomous control. So you go to the next slide. So we also uh, have had in production now for over nine years, a little over nine years, our command for hauling um, 
uh, platform or, or technology with autonomous mining trucks. So we have over 560 of these trucks operating you know, worldwide uh, at 24 customer sites on three continents. Um, they have achieved you know, over 187, so getting close to 200 million miles um, driven uh, autonomously or kilometers, excuse me, del del driven autonomously. Uh, and these stats are, are from October of, of 22. So they're, they're obviously increased since that time because these trucks are always in, in operation. And so I get, I mean, most people can, can recognize, have a frame of reference, you know, 187 million kilometers that that's, you know, a big number. Um, those same trucks have also though hauled over 5.1 billion tons of material. So to put that in a frame of reference, that is um, more than the equivalent of building 500 Hoover dams. And it's also more than the equivalent of a four lane wide highway, six feet deep, all the way around the circumference of the earth. So it's, it's a lot of material that's been hauled autonomously. So you go to the next slide. So, that's the, those are a couple of things that are in production today um, and have been out there for some time. We are right now working on um, continuing to develop really the next generation of autonomy, which we're referring to as one, one autonomy. We're really focusing on a, a structure for the autonomy that allows us to go across all these multiple platform types that you see on the left that we have in our product line that are used in these different industries of resource or mining and then the construction industry across a lot of different applications and have a very common framework in the technology and the resulting experience that the customer and our dealer has to work with these platforms and make sure help to keep them running and so on, but have that common experience of that technology. So if you go to the next slide. So this is just an example of uh, in the construction arena um, as we go from mining and now continue to build and expand out into construction of things that we're working on. Um, this is on a semi-autonomous uh, compact track loader. This is very similar to uh, in its operational you know, concept of operations, if you will, of the semi-autonomous um, tractor system that I just talked about. So in this case, this is for solar farm development. And so when a solar farm um, is uh, built and put into production, they will bring in all the solar panels into a common staging area at the site. And then they deliver those pallets of solar panels out across the whole entire site, typically with a platform like you see here with forks on the front of it. And so this, is, this program is structured around an operator being able to, through remote control, control this platform, uh, multiples of them, three to five of them, and pick up the pallet of solar panels, give it a, its assigned uh, location within the solar farm field where that pallet needs to go, assign that task, and then the platform would autonomously traverse and deliver, drop off that pallet at that location, and then return autonomously as well. And then when he comes back to the staging area, the operator would reconnect the remote control, load the pallet again, and, and send it to its next location. And by doing that, he can, that single operator can, can manage three to five of these platforms delivering solar panels out into the field. So if you go to the next um, slide, so unfortunately <laughs> the video doesn't work, um, but um, so we use very heavily um, physics-based um, simulation development tools. Um, many of those are, some of them are commercially available, but uh, many of them are proprietary as well um, that allow us to model not only a machine and it's the machine dynamics, but the actual soil or the ground that the machine is interacting with. And so in this video, what you would have seen as in the foreground, and it may be, you may be able to tell from just the still, that is actually the, the platform in simulation and it's rendering in simulation. And the background is the actual real platform. And what you would see here 
is a is a truck loading cycle of this wheel loader in this aggregate material. And both in simulation and the real platform side by side running the same exact cycle. And you'd be able to see that it represents what's happening in the real platform very, very accurately in the simulation. And so that kind of capability, I think is probably gonna be very important for people trying to develop actual platforms that are also gonna run on the lunar surface as well. So if you go to the next slide, So these are just some some of the challenges that you know we would see. So on the between terrestrial and, and the lunar kind of environment and application, on the autonomy side, the, the examples that I've shown you today that are in production and so on, um, there's a couple of key things to think about. Those systems that are that are in production are on um, machine platforms that are very mature. Those machine platforms, the type of platform they are, have been in production for decades, many decades. Um, of course, we will come out with new models every few years, but those are, you know, evolutionary steps in that same platform. And so those platforms are very mature. They're very robust in terms of their reliability and their availability and et cetera, that we are then developing autonomy on top of. They're also operating in applications and environments of which, you know, Carl did a great job of taking through many of those and what they look like in the mining side, where there's a lot of knowledge and understanding of that application and that knowledge for this very mature platform. And then we are developing autonomy and implementing that um, into production in that situation where it is necessary, required, or expected it's going to run 365, 24, seven, and that is very difficult. With this lunar application, where you will be talking about or looking at trying to do autonomy on a platform that's very immature. It's never been done before, never been built before on an environment that, although there's growing knowledge and, and there will be continued growing knowledge from uh, the missions that NASA has planned, it's still pretty limited in comparison to the knowledge we have for these machines operating in the terrestrial application. So it's, it's a tall challenge um, in terms of developing the autonomy under those conditions. Another one that um, I've seen, um, you know, in, in terms of NASA and, and so on, some level of focus, but probably far less uh, than I've seen relative to dust, but is in the area of equipment wear. And I think Carl touched on that maybe as well, but um, in this particular picture, you're gonna, you see the, what we refer to as the ground engaging tools or GET. So those are the teeth that you see on this bucket. And then in between each teeth or, or tooth is a um, cutting edge segment. All of those are bolted on and are designed to be able to be replaced and serviced. Um, and in a mining application, it's, it's not uncommon at all that those would have to be changed maybe on a weekly basis. And in some extreme cases, it could be much shorter periods of time even than that. Now, I, mean, I guess I'm not expecting necessarily that level of frequency or wear rate um, for some of the platforms that you're looking at because the size of them and the amount of force that they can generate relative to the material being used is is different than these very large pieces of equipment. But nonetheless, I think understanding the equipment where uh, and what, how you're gonna approach that from a mission operation standpoint is just another area of challenge that, that needs to be looked at. And I think Oliver, that was my last slide. Great, thank you to all uh, of our panelists. So we do have about 10 minutes um, for some questions. Um, I can just kick kick it off right now as we um, get some questions from the community. Um, Alan, this one's directed towards you. What are you looking forward, most excited about um, for space exploration at large? 
Um, and then if you could provide any kind of um, considerations or insights to the teams that are going to be building in situ resource utilization technologies, what kind of things should they keep in mind when they're building those technologies? You know, I'm really excited about us going back to the moon. You know, it's been 50 years. I think I was 16 years old or so when we last landed on the moon. And to be going back there is just exciting for me. And to be able to use these resources that are there, uh, you know, we don't have to carry all of this weight from Earth to the moon if we can use some of the resources. You know, water is like eight, eight uh, pounds a gallon and the average human uses something like 80 to 100 gallons of water a day. So think about all the, uh, the weight that we can save by using, you know, water found on the moon there. So I'm really excited about this opportunity. And I think one of the key points for using uh, resources um, like this and for everybody working on it is to realize we are gonna depend on this. We're not gonna carry all that water with us. And again, these missions won't be successful if we can't find a way to utilize these resources there. So it becomes really a critical, a key uh, point, a key part of our uh, programs in the future. So as you're thinking through this, as you're working through the challenges, you know, let me just tell you, the astronauts are depending on you. We will need these resources there. So make sure I have a glass of water to drink before I go to bed at night. Awesome. Um, so here's another question. I think this also might be directed at more at Eric and Carl. So what are your views on the dust protection and removal of materials uh, essentially due to the temperature uh, being harsh um, in, in on the lunar surface? Well, I mean, <clears throat> so it's not an area that, you know, obviously we've studied in depth, but just my interaction with others you know, in aerospace that are looking at this and, and so on. Um, in these deeply shaded or permanently shaded regions, craters, you know, it's extremely cold. And so material selection for the platform is probably gonna be very important. And are you, are, are you able to get to a material that can deal with the forces we're talking about, but not be super brittle at, at that extremely cold temperature? Right. It's probably going to be a, an interesting challenge um, that has to be faced from a, from a thermal standpoint um, in that environment. Dust. Dust is a problem here on Earth as well. I think it's maybe exaggerated on the lunar surface because it's such a small particle size. Um, so that'll be there'll be some challenges there on how do you seal joints up properly and and so on. Um, for these for these platforms and and deal with that and certainly in the autonomy in the autonomy area you know dust is a problem or a, is an issue that we have to work through and understand terrestrially in, in mining environments and to some degree that's controlled but you do get dust happening in there and the perception systems that are from an autonomy standpoint um, have to be able to be you know to deal with that and so understanding even what the dust environment is really going to be like on the lunar surface because there are some different mechanisms there with, you know, the church, the surface gets charged and so it elevates the particles. And so once the dust gets in the air, does it fall back down or does it, does it just stay there for a long period of time? And so there's, there's a lot of things that have to be understood to even know how to approach it. Interesting. So this is kind of a follow on question to this. Um, another um, participant asked, so what is, um, and again, kind of to Carl, um, Eric at large, what is your experience implementing LIDAR in a surface mining environment where it is expected that the equipment will be operating in a significant uh, cloud of dust? Yeah, so um, so the autonomous trucks that I, I talked about in the, my presentation utilize both LIDAR and radar. <clears throat> and so there are some ways of understanding the dust environment by looking at both of those different types of sensors because LIDAR and radar have different pros and cons or capabilities, you know, things are strong in and things are weak in that when you are using both in the same system, you can leverage those weaknesses and strengths um, 
with each other in order to help deal with and understand with the environment. And if there's dust, understand that and, and be able to reject that from actual perception returns or things that are happening in the environment that um, you need to understand so you don't run into it or whatever the case may be. But having multiple modalities of, of sensing can be important to help deal with that. Awesome. Um, and kind of continuing along this line, um, Pat already has some autonomous mining software. What innovations are you hoping to see from this competition from a software perspective that might be of value? Um, well, I guess that remains to be seen. Um, I don't know how much in this first cycle with the testing that we're gonna to try to do trustfully and so on that we'll see and understand you know, in those environments, dust and how people respond to that. And are there some new potential ways of, of looking at that? And that could be beneficial. Um, you know, it's, some of this stuff is pretty, the autonomy and then the, the details of it and the software are also pretty dependent upon the platform that it's, that it's, that you're working with and so on, which are going to be highly variant here. So it's, it's difficult to predict, you know, what we'll see that, um, that may be of interest. Awesome. So we're just about time. Uh, or Carl, did you have anything to add to that? No, I think uh, Eric got it pretty much accurate there. Um, the major unknown, I suppose, from my perspective is, is the actual uh, engagement with the lunar surface and uh, how we're going to, you know, adapt the instrument what once it's already on the lunar surface to how well to the scenario and the situation that it finds itself in um that's that to me is going to be extremely interesting to see how the teams handle that excellent and this is uh kind of last wrap-up question again thank you so much to our panelists uh don just just wanted to get your thoughts on um you know, what do you remember most about your time in space? If, if you had one or two major takeaways, uh, what would those takeaways be? What would be those memories? You know, I have a, a lot of memories of looking at the earth and I told you I went around it almost 700 times and we live on a, an incredibly beautiful planet. And sometimes you need to leave it to, to remember or to realize how incredibly beautiful it is here on earth. Uh, and another memory I have is the incredible teams that help support our missions. On three of my flights, we had seven astronauts on the crew and one flight we had five astronauts, but there are thousands of people here on the ground that help support our missions. You know, in mission control in Houston, in the payload operations center at the Marshall Space Flight Center, all the NASA centers, contractor sites. It's an incredible team of people that work almost invisibly. You never see them. You see the astronauts on TV, but you never see all these other engineers and specialists. And they're a vital, vital part of our missions. And so for all of you participating in this challenge, you know, know also that you are a critical part of our team at NASA. And again, we can't accomplish these missions without your great help. And, and that's a, just a memory of that teamwork of all my friends that I've made during the mission. You know, that'll never leave, you know, me as well. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much to all of our panelists, and that will conclude today's webinar. So like I said, um, any other phase two or phase three related questions should be directed to the uh, Break the Ice Lunar Challenge admin email. Um, and with that, everyone have a fantastic day.